Now, there are many things I could tell you about Brother John DeBerry, most of which uh, you already know. He's been a Tennessee state representative since uh, 1995 and is on a number of committees to advance education in our state. And we're grateful for every good thing that he does in every good area of life. He serves on a number of advisory councils, very busy man. But the thing that you know about him and the reason he's here at a lectureship is because the man can just flat out preach. He just knows how to preach God's word. And uh, he does so without apology. He does so yet with love for souls. And he has been preaching for uh, since 1968. And so we're talking 50 years of preaching. And it's been at the Parkway Village Church of Christ, the Coleman Avenue Church of Christ, and uh, certainly is uh, well known for his proclamation of the gospel. Uh, he was married to his wife, Georgia, for over 40 years prior to her passing in 2015. They have two daughters and several grandchildren. Uh, Brother D. Barry, we love you because you love God's word, and we can't wait to hear you preach it tonight. There's a message for the lost. There is a fire for you. God doesn't want you to go there, but there's a fire awaiting if we're not careful. And so, Brother D. Bear, come and inform us about this fire and what we can do to avoid it. Thank you. Whenever I go back and think about my childhood and growing up, there are many memories. You've heard me talk about them many times over the years. I was very blessed, B.J., with a, a very good mother and father and a good family around us, which is why our family is as it is. We are a product of very strict conditioning and a very able switchologist. Uh, <laughs> who was able to keep us on the right track uh, all of our lives. And uh, you know, Brother, Brother Mosier and I, we, we talked about this one time, about me and my brothers, my, my two brothers, both of them preach. My, my youngest brother preached this morning. My, el my middle brother is preaching as we speak in Charlotte, North Carolina. And, and uh, I'm here, and my brother-in-law, David, uh, preaches, who's married to my sister, preaches out at Horn Lake and Levi. So I think we turned out okay, but it was not about us. It was about the fact that someone took the time to direct us and straighten us out and get in our faces when we needed it to make us do what was right. One of those things I remember about my father when we were growing up is he loved music. And so there was music always in our house there on Mallory Avenue. We called it Our Hill. And so there was always music there. And at that time, WDIA was the first uh, black radio station, I believe, on in the country that played the type of targeted music that they played. Fast Domino and B.B. And, and King and others were just coming up. But what we would listen to most of all on Sundays, my daddy would play quartet music. So we would listen to the Dixie Hummingbirds and the Blind Boys and the Heavenly Nightingales and a whole bunch of other colorful names of three, four, and five part part harmony as they sang quartet music. Most of the time, a cappella in those days. Well, my daddy thought he could sing. He was a tenor. So he had his own group, for a couple of fellows who were Korean War veterans, went, were in the army with them, and my mama would fry fish and potatoes, and they would get out in the backyard and make racket. And um, that's, what, that's what my mama called it at that time. But, but it was a good excuse to make fish and potatoes. And they even got a chance to be on a contest on WDIA one time. And my daddy eventually there with Nat D. Williams and Rufus Thomas. My dad was a DJ uh, spinning quartet music on Saturday evenings and Sunday Sunday evenings for a while there. Basically, the relevance of all of this is one of the songs that my dad and his quartet, I don't remember what they called themselves, uh, but 
one of the songs that they sang, and I have looked all over the internet, and I've Googled and Hoogled and Yahooed and Yahooed all over the place hunting for that song, and I haven't been able to find it because I distinctly remember them standing around, heads down in a half circle, singing and making harmony. My dad singing a tenor with a fish sandwich in their hands. Uh, that The song was... You may be too late for the water, but you're just in time for the fire. And I remember that harmony. You may be too late for the water, too late, but you're just in time for the fire. And so, you know, they got real animated when they did that. It eventually became one of my daddy's favorite sermons and one of my favorite sermons to hear him preach. Uh, When he turned that, once he became a gospel preacher, And he concentrated not on being a big quartet star, but being a servant of the Lord and a gospel preacher. I remember that as being one of his favorite sermons, and most certainly one of my favorites, that you may be too late for the water, but you're just in time for the fire. And when I thought about that, growing up and thinking about it, of course, I remember his biblical basics for that sermon and the relevance of it was from the book of Genesis chapter 6, as all of you already know of that antediluvian period there when God looked down at man, it is written, as God revealed the Pentateuch to Moses in retrospect, before they cross the Jordan and go over to the promised land, God let them know, let me tell you why you were in the mess you're in for over 440 years, why you were slaves for as long as you were, and you've been walking around in circles in the desert for the last 40 years. Let me tell you why. And God goes all the way back to the very beginning where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, I'm going to begin at the beginning of everything. The book of beginnings is what the book of Genesis is. And what God did for Moses and the children of Israel at that time was, I'm going to put it all in perspective for you. Just in case you want to poke your lip out and claim I did something to you, I'm going to let you know how it all began after I had formed you from the dust of the earth and I had breathed into your nostrils the breath of life and you became a living soul. After I made you something different from the beast that crawled and flew and swam and roared and sang, I made you not a living creature, but I made you a living soul. And God wanted the children of Israel through Moses to understand what he had done for them and how good he had been to them. God even let them know that that woman that you adore, I created her. It was I who looked on man and said, I created man as a social being. He is not to be by himself. It's not good that man, the human race or the race of man should be alone. So God put Adam in a deep sleep, opened his side, took a rib from his side, made the woman, placed her at his side. God says, you need to know this. You need to understand where you came from and what I gave you so you can understand that the mess that you made was not for me, but it was decisions that you made. You made the decision as man to sin. You made the decision after I had given you the earth and only one prohibition, just one, out of everything on this earth that I have given you, I put a tree in the middle so you wouldn't mistake it and say, well, God, I didn't realize that was the one. No, I'm going to put it in the middle. I'm going to put it there so there is absolutely no way to mistake that that's the one I told you not to partake of. God said you took of it and he records it there in retrospect so that Moses can put it in the book of beginning. So the children of Israel, before they go to the promised land, can realize, you know what? It was our fault. God didn't leave us. We left him. God didn't violate us. We violated him. God didn't sin. We were the sinners in iniquity. And God wanted man to understand this before he received those blessings. And then as we get up to that period, in the book of Genesis chapter 6, God gives the history of the antediluvian era and the happenings before the deluge or the great flood. And when we look at the summation of the activities, God clearly tells them there in verses 2. He says, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, 
and they took of them wives all that they choose. In other words, God says, where I had put separation because of purity and because of my law, you decided to cross the line. Basically, the results of sin is the godly line of Seth uh, commingling with the ungodly line of Cain. And God says, look at the mess you made when you didn't separate the holy from the profane, the good from the bad, the righteous from, from the unrighteous. And therefore, God says, I'm going to clean this mess up once and for all. What God said was man's life will not be profoundly prolonged any longer because man has just acted like a beast, like flesh, like he doesn't have a higher self, that I didn't make him in my image and in my likeness, like he's something that crawls around or climbs the trees or slithers around in the dust. God is very displeased with his creation that he loved and had put in paradise and made an assessment of paradise all by himself. God said it's good. Yea, it's very good. In essence, God said, you don't have anything to complain about what I did for you. You shouldn't have anything to gripe about what I've done for you because I made everything for you good. When we speak of the wisdom that opposes God, that wisdom that man chooses, he thinks is wise and intelligent to oppose God's law. One time James in the Gospel of Common Sense, in the book of James, chapter 3, verses 14 through verses 16, he talks about that greed and that jealousy and that evil surmising and evil living and the confusion that comes from it when he said, but if you have bitter envying, if it's just burning inside of you to have something and do something, that is unholy and unrighteousness and strife. You've got conflict in your hearts. He says, glory not and don't lie against God. Lie not against the truth. Because this wisdom descended not from above, but it is earthly. It is sensual. It is devilish. And in verses 16, he says, for where there is envying and strife, there is confusion and every evil works. All of you students of the scriptures and those who exegete passages and do word studies know that that word confusion means instability. God is saying the instability that's in the human race, the instability in your families, the instability in your heart, it didn't come from me because I am not the author of confusion or instability. All of this came because of your desires. As a matter of fact, he went on to say, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. He says, no, no, that's not true. But God, because God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man, what's the beginning, the genesis of your temptations? Every man, what happened to make you step across the line that God drew in the sand? Every man, what made you turn your back on God in high-handed transgression and say, ain't going to do it? I know what you said, but ain't going to do it. It's just that simple. He says, every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust, by his own lust and is enticed. That is the history of mankind. Going all the way back to the beginning, as John said, don't love this world. There's nothing worth going to hell for in this world. There's nothing worth burning in eternity in the lake of fire in this world. There's nothing worth hearing God say, depart from me. Get out of my face. Just get out of my... You know, I remember one time that my, we did something. My mama had left us at home, and I think I told you all about this. Bun Bun, Bunny was the baby then, and boy, we tore the house up. We ate everything up. Everything our mama told us not to do, we did it. We did it. She said, this is for lunch. We ate it. She said, this Kool-Aid is for dinner for the rest of the week. We drunk it up. She said, don't touch this. Don't do this. Don't go there. We did everything, and then we realized she was coming back. <laughs> we, we, you know, Russ, man, we 
realized she, mama's coming back. Mama came through there, boy, and, and she, she looked. And it was the worst day because mama said, get out of my face. I'm the oldest, so she looked me dead in my eye, and I can see her eyes to this day. She said, Nick, get out of my face. I'm too mad. I'm too mad. Just get out of my face. She said, if I get you, I'll hurt you. <laughs> so just get out of my face. Don't you understand that that's kind of the way God's looking at us sometimes? When God looked down at the world at that particular time, when he was looking at his creation that he's been so good to, and what he's seeing are those who have become transgressory. They are his enemies. They are walking against his law. In the days of Noah, just as today, when the Apostle Paul was talking to the brethren at Philippi in the book of Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and verses 19, Paul said, speaking of the enemies of, cross, of the cross, he said, whose end is their destruction, where whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mine earthly things. You can make a change in that phrase where he says enemies of the cross, and you can say enemies of God. Those who are the enemies of God, as Paul was talking to the brethren there, even during the days of the del deluge, look at what he said, how were their enemies? He said their destruction awaits them. Those who are enemies of the cross, enemies of God, enemies of the truth, enemies of the church, enemies of Christians, enemies of what is right. Don't you understand? Uh, we should let the world know in a time when they're telling us how ignorant we are, how backwards we are to follow this old Bronze Age book. It's time for us to stand up and look them eyeball to eyeball and tell them that they are wrong and that destruction stands in their way if they don't change. Of course, we've got to preach the truth in love. Of course, we've got to do everything we can to save every creature in every nation of every language. Of course, we've got to stand and be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Yes, but we need to tell some folks that if you don't change, you're going to lose your soul. And you're going to be caught in hell's fire. God don't want you to go there. When Peter had already broken the Lord's heart because it had been revealed to him that Peter was going to deny him. The Lord, can you imagine Peter? Peter, my brother Peter, my close companion Peter of my close inner circle is going to deny me and say he doesn't even know me. What I love about what the Lord did in that response, it teaches me how to be Christ-like. Because as brokenhearted as our Lord was, he still looked at Peter with love and said, let not your heart be troubled, Peter. Don't let your heart be troubled, brethren. One of you are going to deny me. You're going to forsake me. One of you are going to betray me. But don't let your heart be troubled. I can fix you. I can fix you. And the Lord wants every one of us who listen to his law and follow his will. Don't, I don't need you running and hiding and tucking and talking about how unworthy. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Make some changes. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Yes, y'all who are going to deny me and forsake me. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. And receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. We need to tell the lost that you don't have to stay lost. You don't have to stay blind. You don't have to remain in sin. You don't have to waller in iniquity. The Lord says, leave the trouble, the anxiety, and the worries of this world because I still love you. And we need to get that message out. He called, he said, their God is their belly. They've lost control. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 4, when the apostle Paul was describing those who were blasphemous 
Paul said they are proud or he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions of strife, of words, where comes in this strife, railing, evil surmising, and in essence what Paul is saying to all of us is, get your head right. You don't want to fool around here on this earth chasing windmills, doing things which are not Christ-like, not living in the image of Christ, not preaching the gospel in love, and end up losing your soul. That's not what any of us want to do. You, you've got to consider this, and that's what the Lord wants us to do. In the antediluvian days or in the days of, of Noah, the same reason for the fire is the reason for the water. In the book of Genesis chapter 6 and verses 5, the Bible says God made an assessment of the human race. You know, from time to time, man begins to believe he got more sense than God got. God made a decision to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah by fire. He made a decision that they were not, he was not able to fix them. He made a decision that they were beyond reproach and that they were sinful and wicked and beyond reconciliation. God decided that he was going to destroy them by fire. Abraham says, God, I got another idea because I just don't believe that folks are as wretched and sinful as you think they are. I mean, I want you to know, Abraham was a friend of God, and God wouldn't have put up with that from anybody but Abraham. But I want you to think about what Abraham is saying. God said when he sent the prophet to find the new king of Israel, when he brought son after son of Jesse, and the prophet is saying, boy, that boy looked like a king. God said, don't want him. Well, this one looked like a king too. God said, don't want him either. Well, this one is prettier than the other one. God said, I don't want any of them. And the prophet got a little bit huffy. What God had to tell him is what he has to tell us from time to time. When we start looking at our prefixes and our suffixes, we start looking at our accomplishments and our talents and our treasures and our abilities, and we start thinking we did something on our own. God had to tell the prophet on that day because he had a little boy. He had a young boy sitting out there keeping his daddy's sheep and playing his guitar out there. And he sent him out to him. And when he got there, God said, don't look at him the way you're looking at him. You're looking at him saying, that boy don't look like a king. He said, you're the one that looks on the outward appearance. You're the one that's too easily impressed. You're the one that thinks that everything that shines is gold. You're the one that thinks that a man's charisma equals the fact that he is righteous. He says, no, you look on the outward appearance. I look at the heart. And this is what God is saying. He wants every one of us to keep in mind. You might be able to fool other folks, but you cannot fool me. You may be able to bluff other people. But you cannot bluff me because I'm going to look at what's in you. Who would have thought that when God looked at Saul of Tarsus, he saw Paul the evangelist. But God could do it. The church couldn't do it. There were folks saying, no, I don't want to go around him. He's a murderer. He's a killer. He's a liar. He's a crook. God says, I've chosen him. Oh, yeah, you go preach because I can look at his heart. And what every one of us need to take to heart today is that God is looking at each of us. When the apostle Paul was speaking to the brethren, he had left, he had left uh, Timothy at Ephesus. He had left Titus at Crete. And what Paul told that young man on that day, he said to him that the grace of God, I tore up something. The, <laughs> He said unto him, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Doing what, Paul? Teaching us. Doing what? Teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust that you should live soberly, righteously, and godly where? In this present world. God said, if you're going to get to heaven, don't you know you can't stay? You can't stay. You're just a pilgrim passing through. You can't stay. You're just here for a little while. You're in the tent. 
that's going to be dissolved. The body returns to the dust from which it came, the spirit to God from which it came. And all you own is what you manifested during your life. Your record, your naked soul will stand before me. God tells every one of us, it is appointed unto man once to die. And after death, you are judged. The judgment of what you did during the course between your first breath and your last breath will make a determination as to whether or not you avoid the fire. And for this reason, as Paul said to the brethren, he said, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly. You've heard me say before, that's my responsibility to myself. Righteously, my responsibility to love my brethren. Godly, my responsibility to love my God. In other words, God is saying to every one of us, if you want to avoid this fire, if you want to hear me say well done, if you want to be able to live with me, Forever, where I wipe away all tears. I give you a body that don't get aged, don't get sick, don't need a hip replacement. I give you a body that will last forever. All you've got to do is live the way I told you to live. So what happened? The Bible says, and God saw that the wickedness of man, in Genesis chapter 6 and verses 5, God gives us the reason why he was angry. God said, the Bible says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God says he can't act right, he can't even think right. I can't fix him because his mind is messed up. When we look at the world today and we watch the news every day, and the people that we deal with as we go about our business in the marketplace of trying to make a living and raising our children and doing the best we can to be good citizens, what we see are those who exemplify that assessment that God made. Just as when he talked to Abraham. Abraham said, God, what if I find 50? God said, okay, go ahead, boy. See if you can find 50. Well, well, you know, I didn't find 50, God, but I tell you what. What if I find 40? He said, go on. Go on, son. See if you can find 40. Well, you know what, God? I didn't find 40. 40 is a big number, God. What if I find 30? God said, what about 20? Yeah, go ahead. What about 10? God said, if you find 10 righteous people down in that rotten city, you find 10 people who don't worship idols, who don't commit immoral acts every day, whose minds are not evil continually. You find me 10, and I withhold the fire. And the man couldn't find 10. The best they could do was drag Lot out kicking and screaming. <laughs> Why? Because God already knew. He'd already made the assessment. What every one of us have got to do is listen to what God's trying to tell us. As the Apostle Paul was talking to the brethren in the book of Romans chapter 12, when he talked to them about presenting their body as a living sacrifice, how are you going to accomplish this? He tells them in verses 2, be not conformed. Don't conform. Don't let folks pour you into a mold. Don't let the sinners and the worldly and the fleshly people decide who you are, how you're going to dress, how you raise your children. There are people who sit and watch the television so that they can get information instead of opening the Bibles and getting confirmation from God of what is true. Paul said, be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In essence, Paul said, y'all got to start thinking different. You got to start thinking different. Remember I told you we got folks who want stuff to change on the outside before they change stuff on the inside? And we wonder many times why things aren't getting better. Set yourself apart from the likeness of the world to the likeness of Christ. Don't allow your mind to be a vessel 
and an instrument of wickedness. This will just bring you close to the fire. James said in the book of James chapter 4 and verses 4, James says, know you not or don't you know that friendship of the world is enmity with God and whosoever will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. You know what he's saying? There's no middle ground. You can't straddle the fence. You can't hobble alone. You can't capitulate and compromise. At some point, you got to choose sides. When Moses stood before the people of Israel, he asked them a question. Who's on the Lord's side? And the Lord could come here today and ask many of us, who's on the Lord's side? Problem is, too many of us have not chosen sides yet. We haven't decided if we stand with the Lord and if we're willing to make the sacrifices that have to be made in the world in which we live. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 22, when the apostle Paul talked to the brethren on that day at Ephesus, the same Ephesus, that he said, of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. The same emphasis where John wrote from the island of Patmos in the book of Revelation when John said, you have left your first love. In essence, what Paul said to them that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed. Notice what he said. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Change the way you think. Stop being so easily impressed with so little. One time the Lord was with his disciples and this is one of those things that all of us know but few of us truly understand. The Lord was with his disciples. You had a bunch of big shots walk up in their beautiful clothing and tunics, those who were known for the, in the synagogue and the temple and those individuals who were renowned and the apostles were so impressed. They were so impressed that, you know, this little country boy named Jesus from Nazareth and can anything good come out of Nazareth? And all of these big shots are coming around Jesus. Boy, the apostles say, oh, we're in high cotton now because the big shots are coming around us. When Jesus started preaching, those big shots do the same thing big shots do today. When the Lord start talking about being a living sacrifice, when the Lord start talking about the fact that he was the son of God, that he was the bread of life, when the Lord start talking about his divinity and his responsibility to come and save the world, the Bible says they walked away. The apostles are going to come and do what many do today. When men, like the men who have taught in this school, many of them have preached themselves to death over the years. And there's always somebody that's telling them how hard they are, how tough they preach. And you need to soften up and get with it. Don't you understand that people are offended by the church of Christ and church of Christ doctrine? Don't you understand that we need to understand that the world has changed and we need to approach people in a different fashion. You know what Jesus said to the apostles who were just like many of the leaders in the church today? He said, leave them alone. What'd you say, Lord? I said, leave them alone. What'd you say, Lord? I said, leave them alone. He said, they are blind. And they are leaders of the blind. And he said, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. Who you think he was saying going to fall into the ditch? His disciples. He said, you're going to follow these big shots right into the ditch rather than standing up and having enough guts to say what has to be said. How many of us are going to lose our children, lose our homes, lose our schools, lose our community, and ultimately lose our nation? Because we don't have the guts to say what has to be said when it ought to be said. We're God's children. And we've got to preach the truth. The Lord said, leave them alone. Leave them alone. Because they are blind and they are leaders of the blind. And if the blind be leaders of the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch. When we think of the tragedies of, that are happening now in America... 
It's because men are lost. People are lost. Children are lost. They're not being raised. They're not being taught. Our homes are not the havens that they used to be. Our schools that once concentrated on reading, writing, arithmetic, but they also taught reverence. You can't pray in the schools anymore. They don't even want you to say the Pledge of Allegiance. But don't you know God didn't tell us to soften the message. He didn't tell us to tiptoe behind the theologians who want to show us how to approach people differently in this century. No. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through verses 4, after the catalog of abomination, after telling them of what men are going to be, he said, I charge thee. That same charge is to every young preacher in this room. Every young preacher in this room, you have the same charge that Timothy had, the same charge that Titus had. Paul said, I charge thee before God or by God's authority and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing and his kingdom. He didn't say stroke the people, ease it up, sugarcoat it, tiptoe around it, make folks feel good. He didn't say any such thing. You know why? Because when you do that, you're condemning people to hell's fire. What he said was preach the word. Preach it, preach it, preach it, preach it, preach it. Preach the word. Be instant in season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why, Paul? Why is it so urgent? For the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned, Paul said, into fables. He said, you only got so much time. You got only so much time to raise a child. You don't, you teach him when he's in the, the high chair. I remember Brother Keeble saying one time, while he's in the high chair, not the electric chair. In other words, you teach him while you can still mold him and make him. You have only so much time to change a person before sin hardens them and blinds them to where they never are able to change and alter their ways. Preaching, preaching Jesus Christ is what the Lord wants us to do to keep people out of the devil's prison camp ensnared in his trap. The devil is the pit boss of hell. And when you fall into that pit, you have fallen for the lies of the devil. Paul said this, know also that peerless times are dangerous times shall come. Why so dangerous, Paul? Paul describes 2018. He said, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fears, despising of those who are good, tready, tra traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And then the scary verse is verses 5, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof in other words he said they're going to be folks who sound religious they sound reverent oh they can preach it they can style smile and profile they can stand on the television and cock their head to the side and close their eyes and make folks listen by the thousands he says they have a form of godliness. You've heard me say before, just like the mannequin at the department store. It looks like a human, but it has no life. How many people are going to end up in hell fire because they gave their life, their time, their study, their devotion to that which cannot bring life and cannot give life. This is why the Apostle Paul wanted all of us to change and wanted us to think about these things. Brothers and sisters, it can't be stated what God has done for us better than Jesus stated it himself. 
that from the very beginning in the first messianic prophecy, God don't want you lost. Jesus said in John chapter 3, 16 and 17, he said, for God so loved the world, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever it don't matter what color you are. It don't matter where you grew up. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Who soever. It doesn't matter whether or not you're the best educated or the best looking or the best. Who so ever believeth in him. The Lord said shall not perish. You, I won't let you if you believe and follow me and attune and transform to my image. I won't let you go to that fire. If you confess me before men, if you stand up in this time where folks are talking like to, about Christians like they're dogs. If you stand up in this time when they're coming after the church of Christ as public enemy number one. If you stand up for me when they're trying to get their hands on your children to pervert their minds as they're in the growth process. He says, if you confess me before men, you stand for me now. I'll stand for you before my father, which is in heaven. I won't let you be lost. I refuse to allow my children who are steadfast, unmovable, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, as every one of you in this room can quote, steadfast, steadfast, unmovable. The folks who will not quit, run, buckle, bend, break, or compromise but will stand on what is right. Whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why, Paul? God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. Jesus came to this world for one purpose, and that purpose was our salvation. Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to show us a better way. In 1st, 2nd Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, as all of you can quote, Peter it knows that he's going to be martyred soon. Peter knows that his bishopric is about over. Peter knows that at soon he's going to die. The Lord let him know that only John was going to die a natural death. Peter didn't like it, but he had to accept what the Lord said. And so Peter knows and understands the book of 2nd Peter is his goodbye letter. And to the church that he knows will soon have to operate without those individuals that the Lord on the day of Pentecost gave them the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit and legislative authority that whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter knows that soon they're going to be gone. Paul's head is chopped off on Nero's chopping block. James, I believe, was, was with a sword going through his belly, coming out of his back. They say Matthew was killed in Ethiopia. One by one, the Lord's men are fallen. So Peter is telling the brothers and the sisters that you're going to have to be strong. He said, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness. God don't have to think about it. When he says he's going to do it, he can do it. God the promise maker is God the promise keeper. God says what he means and he means what he says. And all of you have known this and preached this. But he said, is long suffering us ward or to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Lord says, let me give Peter, so let me give you the good news first. The good news is the Lord don't want you to die and go to hell. The good news is God's not willing that you perish. The good news is God is not the mean old God that you hear about that gets delight in the destruction of sinners. That's a lie, Peter is saying. He's not willing that any should perish. The devil is God's enemy and your opponent. Peter said in the first book, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, Peter said, be sober, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, he calls him by name, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Don't you know the devil is a liar? 
He's a juggler. He's a slickster. He's a crook. He's a manipulator. What the devil does is promise what he cannot deliver. He is a usurper. God don't want to lose your soul and he created you. What does it look like God losing your soul to the devil? What does that look like for God? The devil told God about Job. Oh, man, he's a fraud. You think you're nobody. You think you somebody. Say you bribing Job. Say you put every time the man touched something, it turned to gold. He go out and touch dirt, it turned to gold. He says, you bribing Job. You move your hands. I dare you. Move your hands and he'll cuss you to your face. Job was a man of purity and God let him know he's my servant. He is my servant and Job, though he slay me, yet will I adore, adore him. I came in this world with nothing and I will leave this world with nothing. In other words, Job understood that there was nothing on this earth worth forsaking God and turning your back on God. One time folks got up and walked away from the Lord and the Lord looked at the apostles and said, are you leaving too? Are you leaving too? Will you also go? I wonder how many of us today he would come and look at us and ask, are you leaving too? Are you leaving too? Are you going to be unfaithful? Are you not going to stand firm? Are you going to walk away? Will you walk away? How many of us will have the strength to be what Peter was and talk like Peter did and say, Lord, where are we going? Lord, when I walk away from you, what's the logical alternative? Where am I going, Lord, if I walk away from you? Every one of us in this room tonight, every last one of us, we need to understand something. That God loved us enough to send his son to die on the cross for our sins. Every one of us in this room need to realize what Paul said to the brethren in the book of Romans chapter 5 verses 6 and 9. That when you were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. You didn't earn it. You didn't merit it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't work for it. In other words, he says, but God commended or demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, why in the world? The Bible lets me know that hell was created for the devil and his angels. The Lord said, I prepare a place for you. The only way you can even get in hell is to accept the invitation of the current occupant. The Lord don't want you to go there. He wants you to be saved. Nobody has to be lost. Every one of us can be saved if we so desire to be so. I'm reminded of that farmer who looked at what God had given him and rather than turning to God and saying, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Let me share it, God, because the Lord talked about those individuals. He didn't say when I come back again, I'm going to say that you didn't. You only preached a thousand sermons or you only sung 500 songs. He says, no, I was hungry. You didn't feed me. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Thirsty, you didn't give me drink. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit or care for me. In essence, the Lord says, what I'm looking at as to whether or not you can conduct yourself Christ-like. The farmer said to himself, I'm going to build me some new barns. Some new barns. These old barns just won't hold it. This, this house just ain't big. This car is not expensive enough. And don't, don't get me wrong. If, if the Lord give it to you, enjoy it. But just make sure he, you understand he gave it to you. But this farmer said, let me tear down my barns and build me some new barns. God came to him that night. And this man has got to face the fact that he has lost his soul because the Lord came to him and said, fool, fool, what you call me? Fool. That's what I called you. He said, this night, this night, thou soul is required of thee. Then who shall these things be? All this stuff that you think is going to make you a big shot, that's going to make you recognizable, that's going to give you prestige and power and position and pleasure, all of this stuff, he says, I'm taking every bit of it. 
Because your soul, you're going to die. You're dying tonight, dude. I'm not even waiting till morning this night. Your soul is required of thee. The rich man who laid there in the lap dog of luxury, popping grapes in his mouth with folks fanning him on silk and enjoying his beautiful home, while Lazarus lays out there fighting dogs and flies and maggots and fighting the dogs for the crumbs and the slop that's thrown out to him. The Bible says Lazarus died and opened up his eyes in Abraham's bosom. He opened up his eyes in the Hadean realm called Abraham's bosom because he found comfort. And the Bible says the rich man opened up his eyes in hell. And he goes on to say, he said, I am tormented. Could you just send Lazarus, Lord? Just, just, Lord, just send him over here for just a minute, please, Lord. Just let him come over and dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. Lord said, no. No, no, uh-uh, no, no, not one drop, not one drop of mercy, no, no, not one drop of mercy, no, not one drop of mercy. So you laid your sorry self there and watched that man suffer when you could have helped him. And giving him a better life. But no, you watched him suffer and die. Now, no. He's comforted and you are tormented. As we see the story there in Luke chapter 16. In verses Luke 13 talking about weeping and gnashing of teeth. Nadab and Abihu God cut down with fire in their tracks. Sodom and Gomorrah, God burned them up in their tracks. And Korah's rebellion, God sent, God lets us know, don't you mistake me. I'm not slack. I can do what I say. You must understand, I will not be mocked. Y'all not going to make a fool out of me. You're not going to sit up on television and talk about me. You're not going to talk about my word and my son and my people and get away with it. God says, no, no, I will not be mocked. What you sow, you shall reap. The scriptures tell us about nations. Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. In essence, God's trying to give us a wake-up call in America. He's trying to shake us from our lethargy, our mediocrity, and our laziness and triflingness, and telling us that if you don't act right, the deal is, God said, if you fight, I'll fight with you. If you preach, I'll stand with you. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. My brothers and sisters, the Lord's coming back. Just like I told you, mama was coming back. The Lord's coming back. Payday someday. The Lord's coming back. That was another of my daddy's sermons. I used to love to hear him preach. Payday someday. Someday it happens. Solomon said, let us hear the conclusion to the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Why, Solomon? For God shall bring everybody's works, if I might paraphrase, into the judgment with every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. What do you need to do? You need to hear the word. You need to stop playing around. Hearing it don't mean you're sitting there while the preaching is going on thinking about what you're going to do at work tomorrow. You need to hear the word. Hearing the word means hearing about the perfect life of Christ. The greatest story ever told about the greatest life ever lived. Hear it. Hear it. Let it sink in. Let it take root. Receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul. Believe it. Believe it with all of your heart. Not half-hearted belief. Not warm weather, weather belief. Believe it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, as Paul said. Hear it and believe it and decide that I'm going to change my life. I refuse. I refuse to lose my soul. I refuse to lose my soul and open my, my eyes burning. Don't you know the worst thing about hell 
and the fires of hell. All of y'all know the scriptures that talk about hell in the book of Revelation. All you know these scriptures. The worst thing about hell is knowing I didn't have to be here. I didn't have to lose my soul. I didn't have to sit down being sorry when I knew it was Sunday morning and it was time for me to go and remember the Lord's death. I didn't have to lose my soul by compromising and living like other folks in the world. Repent and acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God and bury your old man in a watery grave. Rise to walk in the newness of life. Lord, have mercy, brothers and sisters. There is nothing on this earth worth experiencing the fires of hell over. Nothing. 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 If you need to repent, do it. What you're waiting on. Why are you playing with God? Do it. If you need to change your life, do it. You need to be more faithful, be faithful. You need to be right at home, be right at home. There is nothing on this earth worth losing your soul. Nothing. Think about it.